Welcome, listeners, to the first Inside Kentucky show of 2024. And we are starting with a real bang this year because we are going to be talking about building the best weekend all year. I cannot believe that actually we are mere weeks away. I'm probably going to give my guests on the show a bit of a heart attack if I just remind them how close to the event we are. Um, yes. But the first part of this show is all about building Kentucky. And I have got three of the masterminds behind the brilliant Kentucky cross-country course. I am going to start with a man who's actually been on the podcast before, Mick Costello. Mick, you have been involved at Kentucky since pretty much the very, very beginning of the Four Star. Is that right? Well, I was here for the first Four Star, helping my brother build and well, helping him finish anyway. He spent a couple of years on it, I think. And he had um, Mike Etherington Smith's son and, and a friend of his who was now a big builder over there, Richard Taylor, helping him. And then I came in the last couple of weeks and had to stuff brush and stuff, which I believe he doesn't allow me to do anymore. Too sloppy or something. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Pete, unfortunately, died on in the summer of 98. And so I built the three and four star in 99 and um, then the four star ever since. Before. It's amazing. I've just done some quick mental maths. Nearly 50 years or over 50 years, actually, the three of you have been involved at Kentucky. Uh, Tyson Romanta. Tyson, you have been not only a social media superstar over the last few weeks. <laughs> give us an insight into what brought you into course building. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the social media influence, that's why I got into it. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was my fault. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, right? So no, yeah. I've been uh, I've been involved with horses my whole life. I grew up around horses and riding and competing in in western shows and Gymkhana uh, in in New Jersey. I went to a, a school in Pennsylvania where I met a woman Jane Corey who owned a big uh, horse farm in Pennsylvania. Who uh, they had lessons and boarding and uh, and horse trials through the intermediate level. And as a poor college kid, I could build jumps with her brother John to help pay for my lessons and my board and that sort of thing. And uh, I got the course building bug then. That was in the late 90s. Um, in the early 2000s, I went to, uh, to went to go spectate one of the big events here at, at Fair Hill that Mick was probably building at the time. I mean, it was just, it was awesome and something that I wanted to be a part of. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing led to another and I found myself, you know, uh, riding less and building more. And it really was like a, a hand in a glove. It was something that I uh, immediately took to and I've been at it uh you know, ever since, since, since the early 2000s, uh, doing nothing but traveling around and building things for horses to jump over. And uh, yeah, really, uh, really, really enjoy it. You make it sound so simple. Traveling around, making stuff for horses to jump over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I the, mean, the, one of the first guys that I met who was a, he was a, a professional course builder, a guy, Morgan Roselle. I, I went to help him, his, uh, his then girlfriend, now wife at the time, uh, she, she was teaching lessons and said, hey, my, my boyfriend could really use some help. And I went to meet this guy and he had a dog and a chainsaw. And uh, yeah, I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. And I thought, wait, this is like a job. This is something that I could do for a living. And uh, so, yeah, I was, uh, I was I was I was taken with it right away. And uh, yeah, I, I regret that decision now. It's like, well, now I don't know how to do anything else. So I'm kind of stuck. <laughs> um, I, I have to say, listeners, as we started recording this podcast, there were a number of power tools that sort of got brandished around in front of cameras. Levi, I'll come to you next because you are, well, both you and Tyson are actually, we're recording this Carolina week and you are out on course hiding from the legend that is Ian Stark. Sorry, Ian, I've <laughs> stolen your builders for a couple of weeks. Um, how about you? Take us back to the beginning of, of kind of what got you involved. Well, I didn't really have a choice. I, I grew up on a horse farm in the Belgium and my dad was a professional eventer. And he decided to uh, start his own three-day event in 1980, the year I was born. He, he went to badminton and met the Willis brothers who built badminton and invited them over to Belgium to build his own cross-country course, which he designed. So uh, there I was as a little toddler before I could walk, watch these guys use chainsaws and wood. And I sort of said, oh, th this doesn't look like a bad job to have. So I started following them around and I moved to England, uh, spent four, uh, five years in England building a badminton, Gatcombe, uh, several events abroad, uh, the, the World Games in Jerez, and eventually ended up in the US when I, I got invited by a, by a builder who used to help Mick at Kentucky and 
and I've been here ever since, since 2007. It's amazing. I have to say, so I have a five and a half year old and I'm pretty certain that <laughs> if too. he followed any one of you three around, uh, you would not get rid of him because it would be his idea of heaven. Don't worry about the horses, but the tools, the building stuff all over it. Exactly. Um, can we talk about this, Tyson? You said tongue in cheek, you know, building stuff for horses to jump over. But actually, as builders, there is so much more to that because ultimately, you are builders, you build the fences. You're artists because they are always works of art. You're almost physicians because you take into account so much science and force and so many more things than plenty of people listening to this will realise. Uh, Tyson, just kind of sum up everything that actually goes into building a fence or a course that actually people listening to this just wouldn't necessarily take on board yeah there is so much that goes into it and it's and it's constantly evolving the sport is constantly changing uh new fences new fence shapes new uh you know, technologies with the frangible fences are, are obvious but uh, every day that's that's one of the more interesting things about our job is every day is something different when you're working on the water jumps you might be a, an excavator uh excavating out for the for the actual water feature you might be a plumber hooking up the plumbing that goes in and out of the water jump uh you know the, the next day you're a finished carpenter building a you know some intricate portable that looks like a little house or a castle or something like that and then the the day after that you're chainsaw carving some giant dog or something else you need to you need to know about the turf management that goes into it you're constantly be asking questions about uh you know what what turf is to be grown where and how best to care for the turf. So there is so many facets of course building. It's never just one thing. And that's what really keeps the job interesting is literally on a day to day basis. It's something new and something different. And, you know, some, some days are better than others when it's when the sun is shining. <laughs> You're getting ready for a competition like we are today. That's just really not not too bad. Uh, and other days it's pouring down rain and you're trying to keep the mud from sticking to your boots and it's absolutely horrible. So there's so much that goes into it. It's hard to encapsulate it in just, you know, just a few, uh, just a few words, really. And Mick, from a uh, partnership perspective, we're going to have Derek DeGrazia and, and Jay Hamley on the latter part of this show. So we'll ask them the same question in terms of their relationship right. with you guys. But actually... You are the kind of the feet on the ground, week in, week out, making the preparations to the course. And a, a good relationship with the designer makes a massive difference because the terrain conversation, the placement of fences, that very much is a real partnership between you all as well, isn't it? Right, right. Well, I've, I've known Derek for about, about 60 years. <laughs> Not long then. Don't know him well. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know he calls me several times a week, and and it was just dangerous because he's always thought of something new, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, no, we we have a great relationship, and you know he can say like he forgot to tell me something after the last trip. You know, it was a it was an obvious little terrain piece that uh, I just dumped some dirt and rolled it and laid laid turf and just changed changes so the horses wouldn't land into a bank they landed you know on a on a nicer slope and you know that was from the chicago airport you know and then i go out and i try to put up a jump and the back of it falls off so i got to build a new one and <laughs> but uh no we're, we're we're in a damp area you know when i was building out in wyoming you'd build a jump and it it'd still look the same 20 years later and out here it's it rots after a few years, and so you have to be diligent to keep, just to make sure everything's still sound. There is so much that goes into the maintenance and kind of the development of fences, and I'm sure the the original right. plan A gets tweaked a lot as you go through the year. Um, Levi, we've kind of touched upon the safety aspect a little bit, um, but the introduction of, of frangible pins and mim clips and things like that, how has that influenced building and, and how do you incorporate those into your courses? What's the kind of detail that goes into including them? on the courses that you build. Yeah, when, when the frangible pins first came out, I was a little apprehensive the, the way I was worried it was going to make the fences look odd without any props holding up the rails. But over the years, they've become a standard. Wherever we can use them, if the rails are small enough and they weigh the right amount, we will just incorporate them in the, in the jumps. And the technology has really helped with the safety as, as much as possible. It's still a 
it's a risky sport. You know, there's always going to be risks uh, in eventing, but we've we've come a long way, I think, and we, we incorporate uh, frangible technology wherever we can. How many people does it take during Kentucky Week as part of your team to kind of not only make sure that the course is kept running smoothly, but also to make sure that any frangible devices that are activated are repaired really quickly? Because you guys are like Formula One pit stops, to be quite honest. Pretty much, yeah. Slick, really <laughs> no, slick. Every, every frangible jump will have a at least one uh, one of our course building team members present so we don't have to have holes on the course that's the main thing so they can easily be put back up uh, replace the clips or the pins and uh, so there's no hold on course to keep everything going running smoothly so we, we have a pretty extensive team and we, we very rarely need to hold the the course so we, we're pretty organized i am going to ask as what is probably a silly question do you practice or do you get enough practice at events it, it just comes naturally we, we get enough practice. We, <laughs> when the reverse pins first came out, the first one that was activated took three and a half minutes to fix, and the, the second one took 40 seconds. No, that was in 2010. So uh, Somebody found me. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> That's okay. Hey, Rick, I want to call. Thanks. <laughs> the live uncut <laughs> version for you listeners. This is honestly the place I, I didn't think they would find me, but they did. To prove the truth, uh, really ded- true. dedication to the craft, Nicole, is a, not to timestamp your episode, but today is Levy's birthday. He's oh, here, man. stuffed brush all morning long without complaint. I'll complain later, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel very honored. 30, 33? 34? <laughs> 34, yeah. That's yeah. 34. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, that is dedication to the cause, building on your birthday. <laughs> um, Levi, you kind of deal with a lot of the safety stuff. A lot of the, the kind of the materials and stuff is your domain. You've actually got a sawmill on site at Kentucky right. Horse Park. How do you go about finding materials that not only are the best for the job, but also actually really complement Kentucky and kind of tell the story and the history of the local area. I have lots of friends. <laughs> I have a friend, that, <laughs> of a friend that used to work here at the park who's in the firewood business, and I save all my scraps for him, and he just cuts them up and sells them back to the campground here at, as firewood. And uh, and then he brings me cedar from his his farm. And the cedar is a, a light, fairly strong wood that uh, it's native to Kentucky. It's a, a stinky cedar you put in in uh, closets. And uh, it's it's really been great. It lasts quite a long time, too. How much do you build in your workshop compared to actually out on the course? Um, quite a bit. I mean, uh, I wish I had a workshop, but I just have a area, you know, open area. <laughs> but... Uh, um, I build all the portables here, and they're and the park has um, eight other events, so it's important to use portables so the horse show people don't jump them, because um, we get two thousand horses here at a time for double A horse shows, and they all hack out on the cross country course, and we don't like them to jump our jumps. You know, we try to build as many portables as we can and place them, and then put post them in and stuff. Um, for the event. No, that's all. I do all that here. We had a storm last year on, on March 3rd, which was still in evidence when we had the event last year. But uh, I got so many trees out, out of that storm. It was a 70 mile an hour windstorm all day. And, and uh, I think I built three walnut jumps and all, I'm building a new stick pile right now out of, jump, out of logs that came down on that day. So. Does a little part of you when you see that storm incoming thing? Hmm, wonder what this one's going to bring. No, I stayed home. And actually, a tree <laughs> fell. <laughs> a tree it fell four doors down from me, but it still exploded into my yard. Ah, uh, fair enough. So it was it was a pretty scary storm. And came out here, and all the all the um, all the trees were facing the same direction. So uh, you know how strong the wind was. Every cloud has a silver lining, as they would say, listeners. That's right. Uh, quite literally, That's right. in this case. Um, right. Tyson, we mentioned the art part of things at the start of the show. Because actually, course building now, 
is a work of art. The amount of detail that goes into to some of these fences is absolutely extraordinary. Am I right in saying you are a bit of a, an artist yourself and a carver extraordinaire? How on earth do you create such incredible carvings out of wood? I have a lot of free time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that's not true, don't we? <laughs> Yeah, it's something that uh, that really just that came about from course building. I'm not an I'm not an artist by any means. My 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 literally my entire family. My brothers are graphic designers. My sister is a freelance artist. Uh, they they are actual artists. And uh, no, I'm a cross country course builder who who dabbles in it from time to time. And it really just be, it came from a course designer asking for something to look like a duck. And I would say, sure, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll give it a go. And the first first one probably didn't look so much like what I was attempting for it to look like. And uh, but as you progress, the things get better and better and and you change, uh, you know, the, the way that you do things. And obviously the material that uh, that you get a hold of, you learn what works and what doesn't work. And, uh, you know, what everything has to be a cross country jump first. That's the most important thing. I mean, there's, there's lots of wood sculptors out there that are, that are actual wood sculptors and build some absolutely beautiful wildlife sculpture, but that doesn't necessarily make it a great cross country fence. And so coming at things from the perspective first, that it has to be a jumpable shape and something that is going to, that the horses are going to be able to read and understand and, uh, and work backwards from there. And then let's try to make this thing look like a dachshund. Uh, that's, that will be step two. So that's that's the important part is 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 creating a good cross country jump first, and then the the artwork second. Uh, give people something to look at in between uh, when the horses aren't jumping, something for the kids to climb on when the horse shows aren't going on. I mean, these are shows after all, and they're meant to be entertaining for people. And I think adding that artistic element to the fences is really uh, in, you know important to the sport overall, just to make it fun and exciting for everybody who comes out. Give them something to look at that's uh, you know this just you know not just log after log or roll top or uh, that sort of. Thing. It's, it's huge marketing as well and value for the event because actually when you see these fences and you can kind of immediately go, that's Kentucky, it makes a massive, massive difference. Um, what what do you do? Do you, do you use a chainsaw? Is it by hand? Like, Yeah, most all the work, you don't really, the detail's not so important. I mean, we get the, people only view them from as far, you know, from as close up really as the stringing pegs. And so these are great big uh, sculptures. And yeah, it all starts with the chainsaw. We go all the way down to angle grinders and different die grinders to add some detail to it. But 99.9% .9 of the work is all done with a big chainsaw and big timber. Uh, uh, you know, lots of lots of different fasteners and bits and pieces. Some of them aren't just one big piece, like the dachshunds and the corgis that we have at Kentucky are made up of six different pieces of wood. Um, you know, you gotta, when, when trees get that big, they often have, uh, you know, lots of damage to the inside. You know, they start to decay from the inside out. And so sometimes we have to patch up the big holes that are in the timber and that sort of thing. But uh, it really is a lot of fun. It's it's time consuming and it is tiring holding a chainsaw all day next to your face. But uh, but it, it really is a good time and, and people seem to really enjoy it. So I love doing it. Have you had a favorite that you've made? Yeah, I got to say the, the last year coming up with the, the Coast of Queen Cove with the theming that with the with the brand of Cosequin that hey these are joint supplements for dogs could we could we have a thematic fence we started with that idea and then it turned into well yeah we could we could make a dog that was that, that would suffice for what Derek needs in this particular area and brand it with the mm -hmm. uh with the Cosequin branding well I thought was that was a really that was a whole fun complex we had the corgi we had a dachshund we had a great big log that we carved Cosequin into the back of uh, that was a lot of fun last year and uh, Le Chameau as well, who I think are back again this year. We had camels, which was an unusual request. That's the other yeah. thing. You get some pretty, like, off-the-wall requests. Like, hey, Tyson, you mind whipping up a camel for these? I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll try that. And uh, it turned out great. We did these big boots. Uh, unlike Levy, who speaks 18 different languages, I only speak one. I didn't know Le Chameau meant camel. So uh, that was that was, that was new That's for me okay. to find out, too. Yeah, yeah, see, exactly. So then we made these big camels and we made, made, made the big boots. It was great. I did not know that. There you go, listeners. You learn something new every day. Le Chameau means camel. I just thought they made great wellies, <laughs> to be honest. But hey, there you go. Um, Levi, from from the kind of the timescale perspective, what does it look like, you know, from last year's event to the build up to 2024? What kind of happens when and, and when do you start putting Derek's plans in place and, and where are you at now? 
Well, I've, I've been coming to Kentucky now since 2010. And at the first, uh, I want to say, six or eight years, we would just come over for three weeks and just brush the jumps and put uh, some of the frangible uh, devices together. But I want to say for the last four or five years now, we've been coming over for several trips. So our first trip would be in November and we'd uh, plant all the posts where the permanent jumps and brush jumps go in place and uh, the post for the frangible jumps. And then we'd come back in February and install the frangible hardware. And then we'd have the last trip in April where we'd put the finishing touches on the jumps, brush the jumps, make sure the flag's in the right place. Any any painting, well, Mick does all the painting, but just put on the finishing touches. This, this will be our next trip in uh, in April, like three weeks before the event. And Mick, how does it look like for you? Because obviously you are on site, you see the terrain, you see the weather, you see the ground every single day. So how does it work for you? They're building two new barns down near the start of the cross country. And uh, Derek, in his wisdom, had the five star go right next to where they're going to go. In his defense, well before anything happened. But um, so the last couple of days, I've just put in a new culvert so we wouldn't have to go quite right next to them. And um, it's, uh, the guys are coming here the 22nd or 3rd, and then Derek and all the officials are coming. Well, Derek and, and uh, the TD and Jay are coming um, like the 24th. And after that, I'll be working on footing. But before that, I'm trying to get all the jumps out there in their place. But- and what about the finishing touches can we talk about the kind of the the work of art we've talked about um tyson's carvings and everything else the fence are obviously all, all beautifully built beautifully made but actually yeah. sheila worth yeah. and her team mick sheila is a bit of a kentucky legend herself yes. and has an incredible team of volunteers that put all the finishing touches onto the course well, what they, does that take they come out two weeks before two saturdays before the event and put mulch out and I mean, she gets 16 cubic yards of mulch. And then they uh, come the next Thursday and meet the uh, flower truck. And she, was, she ordered all the flowers in about a year beforehand. And then uh, the Saturday, they plant all the flowers around all the jumps. And all week, because Derek's here and changes his mind all the time, so... Nick, I think there's 130 people or something that helped that, Sheila. Some huge number. I mean, I was pretty impressed when it was 85, but that's 20 years ago. And so she's a whole lot of people, some of them third it's or fourth an incredible, generation. An incredible job. We did a show actually a couple of years ago with Sheila listeners we, on yeah. the Inside Kentucky series. We'll, we'll link it here. It's well worth going back to have a listen. She is an incredible woman. Um, just quickly... Before we wrap this up and go and find out from Derek and Jay, their perspective, um, what do you enjoy the most out of Kentucky Week, Levi Festival, with you? Uh, when we're done working. <laughs> Are, we... Are you ever done working, though? Is that the thing? Do you ever no, finish? No, that's the thing. Uh, no. no, just just seeing everybody. Uh, there's a lot of uh, course builders who come and help out. And then we just, uh, after cross country, we all go out to dinner and uh finally re- get to relax and uh, and then yeah. watch the show jumping uh, on Sunday in the in the stadium. Mick, how about you? About, about the same. It's mostly seeing everybody there I get to see once a year. Because you know, there I mean there are thousands of people that come here and most of them I've known since you know I was a small child and and they uh, well not most of them but quite a few of them and they um, I never get to see them. So Sunday is when I do visiting because I don't have time before that. Derek keeps me running. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. Uh, Tyson, what are you most looking forward to about this year's event? It's an Olympic year. I can't wait to see all the guys that are vying for the uh, for the Olympics competing. That's gonna be uh, that's gonna be fantastic. I can't wait. Uh, it, it's it always adds a bit more drama these Olympic years with the big big five star events. Uh, I think that that's the, uh, the the these these Olympic years are always always the best. They are. I feel like we've all got Paris fever and it is going to be a very important one in terms of US team selection as well. Uh, Mick, Levi, Tyson, thank you all very much. Levi, happy birthday. Thank you for for joining us on your birthday. 34 today. 
that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Go and make sure that Tyson buys you some cake or Ian buys you some cake or a beer at the end of the day. Thank yeah. you all very much. Best of luck for the next few months. And we cannot wait to see what the Kentucky course this year looks like. See you soon. Thanks so much, Nicole. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. So, listeners, we have heard from the guys who bring it all together in terms of the physical fences that we see at Kentucky. But now we're going to find out where those fences come from and a little bit more about how they are created. Um, course designer at Kentucky, going back to 2011, Derek De Grazia, it is lovely to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Nicole. It's great to be back. Uh, I think we did this before it's at one point, so it's great to, great to be back again. I did have to laugh, listeners, and say, I'm sorry, Derek. Every time I see you, I'm cornering you for an interview or something. I'm really sorry. This year, a, a new addition to the Kentucky team, a man who knows Kentucky well. He designed the AECs last year. Uh, Jay Hambly, you are the assistant course designer for Kentucky this year, a new challenge for you. Just give us an insight into actually your your course design journey to this point. Well, for me, it's been quite good. I think I've been lucky to work with some really good designers, namely Derek. Um, and I feel like he's sort of mentored me along my journey. And it's a natural, it seems like a very natural thing to to go and have the privilege of assisting at, at Defender. It is very exciting, actually, this year. You've just touched upon it there, and we've not mentioned it yet, listeners, but Defender, the, the kind of the, the title name of Kentucky 3D event this year, changing to Defender from Land Rover. Um, so exciting that Defender are committed to so much support within the sport. We saw it at Burley last year as well. Um, change always brings a certain amount of discussion, but... Very, very, very exciting for the future and massive thank you to them for all of their support. Um, Derek, I'm going to start with you, first of all, because Kentucky, when you took on the role in 2011, already an established five star. Looking back, you know, we're what, 13, 14 years on from that point now. What was your intention at that time and how do you make your mark on a five star? Uh, Well, at that time... Uh, First of all, I uh, had the opportunity to work with Mikey S. um, in 2009, actually 2008-9, and then for the World Championship in 2010. And so that was a a great uh, learning opportunity and an opportunity for me to understand really what goes on in, in producing these big events, because not only were we getting ready for the World Championship, we were also... Uh, doing the Kentucky event each one of those years as well. And so uh, for me, it was a a huge amount of experience uh, so that when I did take over in 2011, uh, it was was not going to be quite as big a shock to me. And I sort of understood what actually went on and what I was to expect. And so I think that uh, that was, as I say, a, a big, a big learning opportunity for me. And so then when I did take over, I think that Obviously, you're you're trying to change the track uh, from what it has been, and I think you know I always sort of go about these things a little bit like I want to ease into them rather than go in and make massive changes because I I want to be able to uh, see how things are going to ride, and then little by little each year you can start to really uh, make more and more changes, and then you uh, get to the point um, which ha- you know actually happens quite quickly is. Uh, because then you start switching the tracks uh, each year or and definitely switching switching what the course looks like each year. So I think that to me, it's or st- start off a little bit slow and then sort of and then really so you can start to really get going. You make a really good point of that sort of making the course your own and sort of actually you can't come in and, and make all of those changes. What is it about the Kentucky Horse Park um, that makes it so special? in your mind and what are the the biggest things that you keep in mind when you're designing your track well kentucky first of all they have a lot of uh what what i call feature fences which i think a lot of five stars have it also kentucky has really great terrain i think it's uh underestimated terrain there because you're either you're always either going up or going down and and because it's not uh it's not steep going one way or the other that I think a lot of people don't realize what they're actually doing in the chain the the grade changes uh, on course and so I think that that's that's a one thing which I think is 
is quite good about that property. The other thing is that the property is very versatile, and so you can make changes to the track quite easily and also change the loops within the track. So uh, it allows you a lot of flexibility when you're designing from year to year. And where do you begin for this year's course, and when did you begin? Well, I begin uh, every year. I begin... Uh, somewhere between the June and July, and sometimes I've actually gone in May, but um, I, I try to get the track sorted at that point. And so we all understand where the track's going, which helps both Vanessa and her team uh, be able to uh, do start to do their work as far as uh, everything that encompasses sort of and, and goes around where the track is. And then also it helps Mick Costello uh, understand the groundwork that has to be done, and then uh, as I as I once I get the track, then I start figuring out what the jumps are going to be, and usually uh, by my meeting, sort of by the time I get there in late summer or early fall again, I have a pretty good idea about what those what those jumps are going to be, and and uh, actually if there are any any um, dirt works that have to be done, I sort of understand that a bit earlier but but it's really about trying to get the the course to start to take shape a bit more uh in the fall and then by the time we get to november we actually start to put things up in the air and see what they're going to look like um and then by the time we get to february uh we're we're a bit more a bit further along and things are actually going out and uh, jumps are starting to be what they're going to be. And, and then as I come back in March, at the end of March, it sort of, we do our final set and then we're, we're away and, and uh, doing all the decorations and that sort of thing is obviously a last week's uh, last two weeks sort of situation. It is a massive amount of work. Jay, you have been involved in lots and lots of different big events. As I say, you've got huge Kentucky experience, but I think you were part of the building team for the Tokyo Olympic Games as well. So you've been to lots of different events all over the world. How has the process been kind of learning about it from Derek's perspective involved at Kentucky over the last nine months or so? Well, even prior to that, um, I work at a show called Mid-South or, or Haggard Mid-South. And when and it's at the horse park as well so you have to kind of have an understanding of what derek was doing all the time so you don't maybe not do you, you want to do it the best you can for the ground that they're going to have and at the in the fall we run quite a big competition there at the horse park so it was it's always interesting to need to know where he's going and what he's doing to try to limit the damage on the ground um and, and just from understanding that and like you said i've worked at two olympics um and seeing how those go together it's i mean very very natural like i said to go and work with derek at 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 defender this year um and see his tracks you know sworn to secrecy but it's 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 all very good and uh and then you know think about the galloping lanes and the lines to the fences and what the and think more about like what the crowds will do and how that may affect where you're putting your galloping lane stakes and like simple things like that that you might not think about at normal competitions uh, um, tents and you know the marquees and all those things as well I think come into obviously more play you say it's a big secret um, Derek is always a vault listeners the amount of times I've tried to extract some kind of gold nugget of something that we could expect from Derek and he keeps his cards very close to his chest we'll try again later on in the show um, how much of kind of incorporating the crowds and the enormity of Defender Kentucky do you have to consider Derek when when you're designing your track well I think that um, we we understand obviously that there are going to be crowds and we we understand the sponsors and what their what their needs are which is understandable and so it's all when you're designing you have to you do need to be thinking about these aspects uh, because they, you know, there's, there's a, even though it's a big park, when you actually get down to the areas around the jumps, you actually have to think about how the room and, and, you know, I still design what, what I want to design and, and uh, use the space, but at the same time, we always have to be thinking about uh, what the other needs are uh, and that, that are going to need to be done uh, when it actually comes down to 
those last few weeks and, and everything starts going up and you have to just understand the spaces that you have. So that's, that's sort of one part of it. And I think as far as the spectators, um, it is a matter of, you know, you know, especially the really some of the feature jumps where you have huge amounts of, of spectators. And so you basically have, you do have to uh, make sure that you, uh, that there are, and there's room there and that not only room, but also room uh, if you do need to get a horse away from a jump uh, as far as if you have an injury and you need to get a trailer uh, in to be able to take that horse away. It's just making sure that you have the ability to do all these things. So it's, uh, there's, there's actually, you know, looking at it from all different sides. If we go take it back to more of a, an overall philosophy around designing, I always think course designers have such great responsibility because everybody's eyes are on you on cross country day. Um, Derek, you are notoriously relaxed. Um, you are very, very kind of understated about nerves on cross country day. I know some designers get really, really nervous, but actually you're quite okay about it all. What, what is your philosophy behind course design and actually what are you looking for when you build a, particularly a track yes we're talking about defender kentucky here but a track at any level what is it that you're looking for well i think one you have to try to design to the level that's being asked for that competition uh two you try to be able to create a course that's going to keep a rider thinking and a course that it, especially at many levels that is going to be educational for those horses and riders uh, also then you get to especially at the bigger competitions a course that can be enjoyed by the public and so uh, and i think that that's very important especially if you have year to year you, that's why I think to me it's very important that you change things up a bit because I think you don't want the public to come there and sort of see the same thing year after year. So I think that's a big part of it. And I think for the riders at the same time, I, I think changing the courses year after year, it keeps them engaged more because they're, they're having to sort of figure out how things are going to work and how it's all going to relate and fit together uh, on the course. Um, but the big thing to me is making something that is fair to the horses, uh, fair to the riders, and hopefully you're putting something out there that will that will ride well. I mean, and, and you know, we don't, we always, you never know until the day uh, if that's all gonna happen. But at the same time, I think that, um, I mean, I think that's what the intent is and it's not trying to catch people out. It's really trying to put a fair test out there for the horses and riders. Jay, how about that from your perspective? And, and your philosophy on course design as well? Well, I mean, obviously, I've not designed a five-star. So designing the lower levels, uh, four and down, I, I look at it very much as you're, not only are you teaching at the lower levels for them to move on and do things they may or may not know that they need to do, I think they also qualify at those levels. So you have to be very aware that regardless of the time of year or where you are, that they receive a qualification from the track you're on and you don't want to maybe not tell them the truth about what level they're going. You want to be very, you know, to the level so that when they get their qualifying score, they can go on and, and compete at, at another competition somewhere else, whether they move up or in the same level and, and can be successful. And so I try to, look at venues sometimes and, and 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 there are some trends things come and go and Derek's brought some things back like drops and sunken roads that maybe weren't on four stars or five stars for a little while and then you end up with some problems there not problems in any other way you know the odd quit or whatever but part of the reason for that I think is some of the competitions that they qualify at maybe aren't asking those types of things so then we have to look back and say okay we do need to do those skills and have those skills and find a way to do it having said that you can't put everything on a course so you have to pick and choose what what you were going to put on the courses especially through the lower levels because you you only get maybe 32 efforts or 30 efforts or you know not a bunch of them and uh, and then try and that that forces you to put your change out so that they're, they dynamic and don't stay stagnant and and then you can help prepare them for moving on I think that that hits a very important nail on the head, actually, of kind of building up the levels, that real responsibility to make sure that the riders that then go to the five star 
are ready for that challenge. And I know, Derek, you you design at various levels as well. It, it's so important to be able to make sure that you've given them the education as you go up for the challenges that they're about to face. Um, Derek, you took over as course designer at Defender Burley a um, couple of years ago now. So you've got a couple of five different five stars, very different terrain, different parts of the world. How has designing Burley influenced or has it influenced what you can bring to the table in Kentucky as well? Uh, as you know, Burley is Burley and Burley is a whole different venue and there it it has its own challenges. Um, and to me, it is, it's very challenging to me designing at Burley, but at the same time, it's, it's um, been very enjoyable to be able to do it. And but it really makes to me it makes you think. I think all of all of these places is it's the same at Kentucky. Kentucky is a, again a different venue, different site, and so you have to. To me, I go into it um, sort of with a blank sheet of paper every year, and I do the same at Burley as well. And we know we know that both of those venues do have terrain, and the terrain comes makes it's a big part of what you do on these courses. And for the riders the terrain um, really comes into play and it makes them have to understand how the jumps are going to uh, be affected by the ground that is being used with those jumps. And it makes the riders also have to understand their horses more and how their horses react. Uh, so I think that that it's, to me, it's, you know, whether it's, you know, Burley or Kentucky, I mean, they're, they're obviously quite different. Um, I think in, in Kentucky, I obviously I have probably more flexibility about where I can go with the course uh, at Burley, uh, not so much so. And so you have to be able to sort of use every piece of ground in different ways uh, and use the track and, you know, be able to move one way or the other uh, within the track to be able to create different different things that hopefully, you know, the riders haven't seen uh, before too much anyway. And so you're always trying to create, you know, obviously create something different. And so, um, but yes, very, very different venues. And uh, again, that's, that makes it even more enjoyable for me. It allows you to flex different creative muscles in different places and, and kind of come up with different ideas. Um, one of the things that I think is so important in the sport and we talk about it a lot in terms of legacy and, and kind of being able to engage with fans and that kind of thing is is having those fences that are really one iconic but two tell the story from a sponsor's perspective Derek how important is that from your side of things and how much does that play a part in terms of when you're designing your course no, I mean, I think that these these jumps and, and uh, Burley has obviously a number of them, but Kentucky uh, has them as well. And I think that to me, it's it's just where where you put them on the course. It's really one of the one of the big things. But I think that you always know that one these jumps are there for a reason. They're the public knows these jumps year after year. They they can put they can sort of cite them all. Um, if they're going to Kentucky, they know the ones at Kentucky, and so it's the same thing. Whether you go when you go to Burley, I mean, they can probably you know list them list them all, and um, and then it's really within within all of these different sort of feature feature jumps and iconic jumps, um, and certainly ones where you can change what happens uh, in those areas. It's to me that's sort of the challenge is being able to come up with something that uh, is going to be sort of worthy of that of that jump um, on a year after year basis. And because you know that there are going to be big crowds, there's going to be television uh, at these at these sort of major fences. And in not only that, you obviously have the sponsors that are involved that sponsor these fences and and they obviously want something uh, that's going to be a great feature fence uh, and on the course and where um, they're going to be able to not only uh, have their presence known but uh, have a lot of good pictures and and horses jumping these jumps uh, at their jump. 
good pictures. It comes a lot down to that and kind of being able to showcase the sport in the best possible way. Jay, with your sort of designer hat on, but also with your builder's hat on as well, how important is that relationship between course designer and course builders? And actually, how much as a designer do you kind of then look to the builder to have their input as well? Um, Well, obviously, I'm more experienced from the builder point of view. Um, but very much so in the sense of you get a, an idea or a concept from, from like Derek or whatever designer you're working with. And then you have to understand what it is they want. And then you go through and you often talk to them about different types of materials you can use or different shapes. And, and, and the material is quite important because you can get different things in different parts of the world. And then how you can make that jump interesting or have texture change in it so horses can identify where height ends and spread begins, for instance, and and how you can do it in a way that makes it as useful as possible for the designer in the future. Depending on how much they want to do in changes for a certain competition and how many, much time you have as a builder or are given from the, by the organizer, then you can look at the more featurey type fences that they want and then really go through them with them and try and figure out what they want and then how you can produce it for them, um, which is which can be challenging sometimes because sometimes you don't have the luxury of time to make a lot of adjustments. So you kind of, you know, you, today's technology is great because you can do a lot of FaceTiming and pictures and basically talk on the fly. But I think it's super important to communicate. Nobody will know the venue typically that you're at better than the builders. So if I'm in Virginia, you know, I go, I go to Tyson. He's a builder in, in Virginia, and, and it's the same at Bromont. Derek will go to me they'll know the ground better than anybody else where to go where not to go and and how we can make the tracks work the best possible way for them it's a massive team effort i learned something new derek on the first part of this show uh that le chameau means camel yes yes i mean mind blown (laughs) as i said as i said to tyson a little bit earlier on i thought they just made great wellies but there we go um (laughs) The, the creative input there, like you can be quite imaginative, and that must be really fun. Oh no, it it, it is, and uh, and that's where actually having a great group. Obviously, in Kentucky, there's there's Mick and there's Levy and there's Tyson, and and I think between all of us, if we sort of have something that we sort of put our heads together and try to come up with, and it uh, is going to work, especially when you start talking about. Um, what the sponsors are are needing for their jumps. Now, I am going to put you on the spot and see what we can get out of you in terms of 2024. What can you share with us about this year's course? You've got to give us something, Derek, anything. Come on, we're all friends here. Yeah, no, of course, of course. And uh, again, you know, this the course this year, you know, I guess, you know, everybody says, oh, which direction is it going? Well, I guess it's going the opposite direction of what it went last year. So so that's sort of actually uh, a big change uh, in, in the way the course lays out and uh, what sort of comes at what point in the course, because w- when you do that, and I, I think I did that a couple of years ago, we went we went sort of the opposite direction. But, you know, what happens is that then the head of the lake comes comes early earlier in the course, which which again I think is actually a good thing because um, it is it's a, it's sort of I think when you get when it's at sort of four to five at the four to five minute mark in the course it's it is it it's early but they've also actually had quite a lot to do before they even get there so I think there's quite a lot there's quite a lot in the first three minutes of the course. Um, you really have to be on your toes and, and ready to jump some jumps because there's a lot to do. So what I say then is that if that's the way it is going that way, then what happens is that the park question, the coffin complex comes quite late in the course and which comes sort of at nine minutes, which it did, I think, a couple, two or three years ago. And uh, which, again, it actually jumped quite well at that point, uh, but it also... Uh, when the horses are starting to get a little bit on the tired side, you have to you have to be able to ride a combination like that at that point in the course. And so I think that it, that it does change things around a bit uh, as to where it sits in the course. And so uh, those are some sort of the, sort of the big things that that do happen. And um, you know the other the other sort of feature fences then all sort of come into into play, but they're 
I, to me, those are sort of the big the big things is, ha is having the head of the lake come earlier and then having the coffin come later. So, uh, which I think when you do when you run that way around, it sort of makes that makes a difference. Have you got a rough optimum time yet? Uh, yes, it's I would say somewhere, and this is sort of guessing only because I haven't done a final on it, but it's sort of somewhere going to be around eleven minutes twenty seconds. Well, that's so, very specific. Okay, so, there we go. There are thereabouts. It's, it's somewhere, somewhere close to that, anyway. And, and what about this year? Obviously, we've got the Paris Olympic Games on the horizon. Kentucky is one of the final trials for the US team. We've got the four star as well, which we could well see a, a few of those kind of key combinations competing in, in terms of a, sort of their final preparations. How do you design in Olympic year? Is it any different? And and how does that factor into your plans for 2024? I guess the short answer is it's not any different. Um, I, I design a five-star course like I do sort of, or like I try to do every year. So that is is what I do. Obviously, we have the four star class, which has actually been a, a sort of a very well received class, um, running it, it with with the five star, and so I think that that is, is actually quite quite exciting. You get some great horse and rider combinations, and uh, and as you say, I think that you will have some of those that sort of take uh, a buy on doing the five star going into that class, and so. Again, uh, I think that'll be a very competitive class this year, as it always is, but I think it'll be quite competitive. It's really interesting, the dynamic that the four-star has brought to Kentucky, and actually it's pretty established there now. I think we're in the fourth year of the, the, yeah, the four-star four running. Year. Yes. Yeah, and, and it feels like it, it always takes a bit of time, doesn't it, for change to bed in. It feels very much there. Jay, you kind of touched upon a little bit earlier on that sort of progression um, and actually, you know, the lower levels being the stepping stone to get up to the top level. And, and actually, that's a real example that we have with the four star in Kentucky. Um, coming into this year, what are you most looking forward to, Jay, from your perspective? From my perspective, having walked some of the distances with Derek, well, we set quite a bit of the track, um, I think almost three weeks ago, maybe in February. And watching how the lines are going to ride when we're there on site and live i think and some of the distances if they're as we as we discussed or as derek thought and um, i mean that's what i always find most interesting is how the ground affects the way the horses jump and whether they the bold ones take the the, the tighter lines or they they hold out a little bit and add the strides um those are the kind of things that i find very very interesting as far as the four star to the five star there's definitely a progression between the two um as you go around is I don't think there's anything you see on the five star that you don't see them sort of prepared for in the four star. Um, it's a much shorter track, obviously, and less shorter fences, like number of obstacles, but uh, it's mostly for me, it's the lines and the, and the distances that I find interesting over the terrain. Talk to me about the, the distances just quickly, Derek, are you very scientific or are you very much feel and kind of, how the terrain plays a particular bit of impact. You no, know, I'm. I think definitely much more feel and uh, trying to understand what the terrain's going to do and how it's going to affect the horse's stride. And so, um, yes, I I would say that I would be more of that direction. Honestly, listeners, there is so much that goes into to designing and building, of course, at this level. Um, Derek, Jay, I appreciate your time so much because I know things are pretty busy. You have got lots going on. Jay, you're in the middle of an, a cross-country course. Um, yes. We Sorry. we had half the guys half the guys kind of skiving off their work in Carolina as well. So look, I'm going to let you guys all get back to it. But thank you very much for giving us such an insight. And we cannot wait to see what we have got in store at Kentucky. Derek, you've given us loads. I'm excited for this. You've even well, there, there. You are there. You are. So I'm um, <clears throat> I'm I'm hoping that uh, everybody will sort of you know get their maps out and they'll try to figure out what's going to go in between all these places. Watch this space. Uh, Derek, Jay, thank you both so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I look forward to the next few weeks. Very, very exciting as we build up to Defender Kentucky 2024. Listeners, the countdown is officially on. Do stay tuned at the next show on the Inside Kentucky series. I think it's going to be a sneaky peek 
insight at this year's entries. We've heard plenty of rumours flying around. I'm on a bit of a British stalking list, listeners, I'm not going to lie. I think there's some exciting overseas combinations going to be making the trip, but there are going to be some brilliant US combinations as well. So watch this space. But for now, a massive thank you to all of our guests and, of course, to you guys for tuning in. <laughs>